thank you very much for coming along. This evening we're going to look at a very important document that has come out in the last month. In fact, on the 18th of June, the Vatican announced a very important document, probably the most important document ever to emerge from the Vatican, certainly in our lifetimes, and it's perhaps the most important document to come out from any institution and public figure, in this case the Pope, more important than any statement made by a president or by a head of a university or by anybody that we usually regard as leaders. Uh, the single most important document on the environment and climate that has yet been issued. In English, it's 184 pages. It's called the Papal Encyclical. And it's one we want to examine in detail because we'll be looking at it over weeks, in fact months in detail, uh, chapter by chapter when we have a chance to look at it in detail. But you should get a sense of the importance of the event itself, the end of June, and how it's being received around the world at this point. We're going to talk about it in terms of the prophetic Pope, Pope Francis and the transition to a sustainable future. On the 18th, Pope Francis issued the papal encyclical Laudato Si. That's the Latin for it. And it's quite an extraordinary document. He reads it in several languages and he publishes it simultaneously on the web in both an HTML and a PDF format so that the entire world can get access to it immediately. It's paginated, that is, there are pages in it for the PDF version of it, but it's also numbered by paragraph. And so you can locate every single sentence that he says within it. And he starts off by saying that he wanted to write the encyclical keeping in mind the memory of St. Francis. As he puts it, I believe that St. Francis is the example par excellence of care for the vulnerable and of an integral ecology lived out joyfully and authentically. Now that concept of integral ecology is going to be a very important one throughout the letter and throughout our thinking about it. Listen to the news reports on the issue. It's really quite staggering. We turn now to the Vatican, where Pope Francis has called for swift action to save the planet from environmental ruin, urging world leaders to hear, quote, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Earlier today, the Vatican published the Pope's long-awaited encyclical on the environment and climate change. Pope Francis called for a change of lifestyle in rich countries steeped in a, quote, throwaway consumer culture and an end to obstructionist attitudes that sometimes put profit before the common good. Our house is going to ruin, and that harms everyone, especially the poorest. Mine is therefore an appeal for responsibility, based on the task that God has given to man in creation, till and keep the garden in which he was placed. I invite everyone to accept with open hearts this document, which follows the Church's social doctrine. Pope Francis said protecting the planet is a moral and ethical imperative for believers and non-believers alike that should supersede political and economic interests. He also dismissed those who argue that technology will solve all environmental problems and that global hunger and poverty will be resolved simply by market growth. That's crucial. He's dismissing, in effect, those who are saying, all we need to do is grow our way out of this. He's saying, no, no, that's the source of the problem, not the source of the solution. Growth economics have led to the inequities and the patterns of despoilation of the earth that we can no longer afford. This is very clear, and it's straight from the Pope's writings. It's un ambiguous and unimpeded at this point. They put out their own video on it in several different languages, uh, straight from the Vatican again. Just get a sense of the flavor of it.
very straightforward appeal here. What kind of world do we want to leave to those who come after us, to children who are now growing up? You can't get a more direct statement, certainly from any public figure in the world's limelight today. Uh, it's an extraordinary document, and we'll want to look at it in detail. Of course, the U.S. Catholic bishops received it with open arms and gave a press conference at the National Press Conference in It is a joy for National me to be press with all of you today, and, and I have to begin by saying yesterday uh, Pope Francis asked that the encyclical be received with an open heart. And so it's with an open heart and with deep gratitude that I, and I must say along with all the brother bishops of uh, the United States, we welcome this new encyclical, uh, Laudati Si. Uh, Mark is right that some versions are 180 pages. Mine was 110, and I guess uh, it was because the print was a little smaller. So, Well, the different print and the different formats. It's both available in a PDF format and in an HTML format. So you can take it off and study it, take quotes from it, and it's presented very in, symbolically by several of the cardinals, establishing some new categories. In this case, it's very interesting that John Zinzulas, from the Eastern Orthodox Church, he's the Metropolitan, the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church, not noted in history for their long and cordial relations with the Roman Catholic Church, these two principal Christian traditions have come together on this. And it's John Zizoulis who's, in effect, announcing this whole concept of ecological sin. It's really quite amazing. This encyclical comes as a at a critical moment in human history and will undoubtedly have a worldwide effect on people's consciousness. Those who read the encyclical will be impressed by the depth and the thoroughness with which the ecological problem is treated and its seriousness is brought out together with concrete suggestions and proposals on how to act in order to face its consequences. There is in its pages food for thought for all, the scientist, the economist, the sociologist, and above all, the faithful of the church. As it emerges clearly from the encyclical, the ecological crisis is essentially a spiritual problem. The proper relationship between humanity and the earth, or its natural environment, has been broken with the fall, both outwardly and within us. And this rupture constitutes what we call sin. The Church must now introduce in its teaching about sin, the sin against the environment, the ecological sin. Repentance must be extended to cover also the damage we do to nature, both as individuals and as societies. Now that's really quite extraordinary. It's not any longer a personal sin alone. It's this question of whole societies acting in an ecological community. Now you'll see here that the Metropolitan of the Eastern Orthodox Church is flanked on his left, on, when you see it on the screen on your right, by Peter Turkson, who is the Archbishop from Ghana, who had a very strong role in writing the basic first drafts of this. Now, it's not just within the Christian tradition that the response has been extraordinary. The Dalai Lama came out within days and <laughs> in full support of the Pope. Uh, the American news system, of course, got on the bandwagon and reports on it on Yahoo. I'm Katie Couric, and this is a Yahoo News special report. He is a man of many firsts. 
the first Jesuit pope in church history, the first pope from South America, in fact, anywhere in the Americas. He was the first pope to use the word gay instead of homosexual. And now in his first major encyclical, which is a significant teaching letter, he is taking on climate change. In that encyclical, he writes, we must be grateful for the praiseworthy efforts being made by scientists and engineers dedicated to finding solutions to man-made problems. But a sober look at our world shows that the degree of human intervention, often in the service of business interests and consumerism, is actually making our Earth less rich and beautiful, ever more limited and gray, even as technological advances and consumer goods continue to abound limitlessly. Now, this is really extraordinary. She's taking some of the paragraphs, which I'd urge you all to start looking at in detail, and you can very quickly. But take a look as well as the response of other people, especially in the environmental community. Bill McKibben came out very quickly with a, an article in the New York Review of Books, inhaling the whole encyclical as in a major step forward, as he says, the cry of the earth. Naomi Klein, who was here earlier last year in the Cambridge Forum, was called to the Vatican and invited to be part of a conference on the whole issuing of the encyclical letter. Again, not noted for her strong tradition within the Catholic Church. Uh, Naomi Klein is a very outspoken environmentalist. Uh, she wrote just yesterday, that is July 10th, Naomi Klein wrote a lead article in The New Yorker entitled A Radical Vatican, and her assessment is really quite extraordinary. You know, I think that this encyclical, we can't overstate the importance of it, uh, the impact that it will have. Um, it's hard to respond to a document that runs uh, close to 200 pages when it was just released uh, in non-draft form uh, a few hours ago. We're all still digesting it, uh, Amy, but it is very clear that a uh, door has just been opened and, and uh, a gust of wind uh, is blowing through where it is now possible to to say some very powerful truths about the, the real implications of climate change, uh, really the root causes. And I think a lot of the discussion about the encyclical in the U.S. media cycle has focused and will continue to focus on the impact on Republicans and on climate deniers, uh, um, many of whom are Catholic. And it is certainly a challenge uh, to that demographic in the United States because the Pope is coming out so clearly on the side of climate science and saying this is real and this is happening. But I think that it's too easy to say that this is just a challenge to uh, Rick Santorum and Jeb Bush. Frankly, it is also a challenge to Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and to large parts of the Green Movement uh, because it is a rebuke of slow action. It very specifically says that uh, climate denial is not just about denying the science, it's also about denying the urgency of the science. Uh, it, the, the document is very strong in condemning delays, half measures, so-called market solutions. It very specifically criticizes carbon markets, the carbon offsetting uh, as an inadequate measure that will encourage speculation and rampant consumption. And I think probably the most significant part of it, the big picture, is the foregrounding of the culture of frenetic consumption in the wealthy world and among the wealthy. And this is really significant because I think large parts of the climate change discussion tries to have it always and say, no, we just will just have green growth. We'll just have we'll, we'll consume green products. And uh, you know this goes a lot deeper than that and says, no, um, we need to get at the underlying values that are feeding this culture of frenetic consumption that is entirely unsustainable. Entirely unsustainable. And this is a pretty extraordinary statement by the man in charge of one of the oldest institutions in human history. Uh, she was invited to the Vatican itself, to be part of the press conference in opening up the discussion of this in the early days of July, some editorial writers said, well, 
we read it so you don't have to, in a sense, and they summarize it for you. But I'd urge you to get beyond the summaries of the journalists who don't fully understand the issues themselves and look at things like this conference of people on the planet first, the imperative to change course. This is the conference that took place in early July, less than two weeks ago, uh, at the Vatican, where Naomi Klein gave the keynote address. It's pretty extraordinary. Get a hold of a copy of it yourself from Transition Studies. Just go down to the search engine here and type in uh, Pope. That's all you need to type in. And you'll get back a list of stories that have been covering this issue. You can get a copy of La Laudato Si itself, that is the encyclical, by typing in Laudato Si and click on that and you'll get the original. Here it is, the encyclical. Call it up. Look at its table of contents. It's extraordinary. Start with, okay, what is happening to our common home? He lines it out very clearly. Pollution and climate change. Bang. First thing of chapter one. Pollution and climate change. Pollution, waste, and a throwaway culture. Climate is a common good. These are not subtle statements. These are the paragraph indications, paragraph 23 through 26. Here's the page upon which it's found. You can't lose yourself in this. This is an extraordinary public document from now on in. The biggest, the most important, the most concise, and the clearest to have ever emerged from a public figure in the modern world looks at the biodiversity issue, the loss of biodiversity, the question of water, looks at global inequity very squarely. This is a crucial thing in his own message and underscores the absolute weakness of everything tried so far. This is where you get that critique of the carbon tax and the people who are slowing things down. And Look at chapter 3. Chapter 2 is devoted to the theology of it and those of you interested in that should look at chapter 2, but if you jump ahead to chapter 3, you look very clearly at the critique he's got of the human roots of the ecological crisis. Technology. Globalization of the technocratic paradigm has a lot of things to say about that. The crisis and effects of modern anthropocentrism, thinking that humans are the center of the ecosystem. He's saying, oh no, they're not. We better figure that out fast. Chapter 3, here's where he introduces his amazing new concept called Integral Ecology, borrowing it from St. Francis. Take a look. Environmental, Economic, and Social Ecology, the principle of the common good, underscores it again and again as absolutely crucial. Justice between generations. Intergenerational ethics is a focus of this in Chapter 4. Chapter 5 gives lines of approach and action with specific statements about what we ought to be engaged in, dialogue and transparency in decision making. None of these secret trans-specific partnerships that are going to have an enormous impact, none of these secret deals. Transparency in what's being done. Ecological education is the chapter 6 that ends it and calls for towards a new lifestyle educating for the covenant between humanity and the environment. Ecological conversion. This is pretty extraordinary stuff, right? This isn't just more of greenness. This is straight from the Pope and radical. We have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. In Bolivia, he makes this very clear and does a, an extraordinary public apology for the Catholic Church's role in the conquest of the New World, especially the conquest of the indigenous populations. Never before has this ever been seen. Um, he also slams consumerism in this recent trip to Bolivia. He went to Ecuador, Bolivia, and Paraguay just this last week and hammers home these themes. We must regain the conviction that we need one another, that we have a shared responsibility for others in the world, and that being good and decent are worth it. We have had enough of immorality 
and the mockery of ethics, goodness, faith, and honesty. It's time to acknowledge that light-hearted superficiality has done us no good. When the foundations of social life are corroded, what ensues are battles over conflicting interests, new forms of violence and brutality, and obstacles to the growth of genuine culture of care for the environment. Now this is something he's in full agreement with the scientists on. Fossil fuel um, future has been underscored as totally limited by the scientists. Top scientists are indicated that unless we implode the fossil fuel industry, we won't be able to avoid disaster. Just this last week, the scientists have underscored this point. And yet, there's an effort on the part of the right wing to, um, in effect, deny that the Pope has any uh, perspective here. There's a straightforward collision involved between the Cokes... 69% of Americans this. call it a serious threat. 97% of scientists say something must be done. And now, 100% of Popes agree combating climate change is a moral issue. The Pope's message to people of faith underscores the obligation we have to future generations to address climate change and protect our environment. But one group is desperate to attack Pope Francis and protect their pollution profits, the Koch brothers. They even sent their big money stooges to Rome to attack the Pope and his moral call for climate action. And these mega polluters say they plan to spend nearly $900 million to put a Koch brothers endorsed candidate in the White House. That's why Republican presidential hopefuls are tripping over themselves and each other to attack the environment, attack climate change, and even attack the Pope. 100% of Popes, 0% of Kochs. They've made their choice. Who do you stand with, the Pope or the Kochs? Visit popercokes.com. Okay, who do you stand with, the Pope or the Kochs? The prophetic Pope has really come out with an extraordinary document, the most extraordinary document in human history since the emergence of the Catholic Church about 2,000 years ago. Pope Francis and the transition to sustainable future has been launched. You can take a look, take a look yourselves, and look at the way in which transition studies is now underway.